We need to stop referring to what has happened over the past year and a half as COVID. I've been guilty of it too, but we need to stop it. You know, when people say, oh, we had all of these plans for last year, but then COVID happened. Or, oh, yes, that was going all well and good, but, but then COVID. And so, you know, we couldn't live our lives anymore. What happened last year is not because of COVID, that huge political and social revolution. It is because of the lockdowns and the other measures that cynical and opportunistic politicians implemented using COVID as an excuse. And that's not some wild, crazy conspiracy theory. That is a strategy that we all knew the left was using even at the time, and that right now even the White House is admitting. The president wants to make fundamental change in our economy, and he feels coming out of the pandemic is exactly the time to do that. And if we don't do it now, if we don't address uh, the cost of child care, to go back to Josh's question earlier, if we don't uh, address the climate crisis, if we don't ensure that universal pre-K is a reality now, uh, we're, we're not going to have the same opportunity to do it for some time. We're not going to have the opportunity, and that's what COVID is for the left. It's an opportunity. Sometimes people have called it a great reset. They've called it this major revolution. But it's not the wacky conspiracy theorists. It's the left who is admitting that that's what they're doing. The left never lets a crisis go to waste. Perhaps we ought to learn that lesson. Perhaps we ought to use crises to our political advantage as well. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. My favorite comment yesterday is from, it ain't like that, bro. We was just texting. <laughs> That's the name. I like that comment too. But, but the comment is, quote, the funniest thing is when liberals label you a, quote, conspiracy theorist for, for calling their plan an agenda. Right. When you say, hey, look, the libs said they were going to do this thing, and then they are doing this thing, and this is where that thing is going. They call you a conspiracy theorist, even if you're playing their own words against them. That, that you cannot do. If you ever call out the reality of what, of what they are doing, they will label you as delusional and try to get people to ignore what you're saying. But I think it's time we start paying attention, because the economy in particular is collapsing all around us. And you know one great way to hedge your investments against those economic crazy times? Acre Gold. Despite what you might be seeing in the establishment media and the corporate press right now, everything is not tickety-boo. Actually, prices are all over the place. Inflation is going up. The economy is really in shambles. Good way to hedge your investments against economic craziness is to invest in physical precious metals. Now, I know you're thinking, Michael, all right, I don't got it like that. I don't, I don't have the kind of money in my couch cushions to invest in physical gold. What if I told you you can do it for $30 per month? Michael, you lie. Calm down. Calm down. I don't lie. Acre Gold has figured out this ingenious way to invest in physical gold without coming out of pocket all at once. You can do it for as little as 30 bucks a month. You can also get their $100 a month subscription to a five grand gold bar if you want to up the ante. But whatever you want to do, you subscribe. When your gold stash reaches the price of their gold bars, they will discreetly ship Acre Gold to your door. Make sure you check this out today. You can do it by going to getacregold.com slash Knowles. Start investing in physical gold today. Make sure you go to that URL uh, because Acre is giving away a gold bar. To qualify for the giveaway, tweet or post why you should be the recipient and mention at get underscore acre. Uh, go check it out right now. Getacregold.com slash Knowles. And thank you, Acre Gold, for supporting the show. What more evidence do we need? <laughs> you have the White House coming out. And this, by the way, you know, poor Jen Psaki was getting in this exchange with a reporter. She's got a lot to defend right now. And a lot of what she has to defend is indefensible. The border collapsing, turmoil, let's go Brandon chance happening all over the country, nay, all over the world, and the economy falling apart. And she says, look, look, we're trying to completely upend the economy. We're trying to reorder society, all right? We've got to do it now. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, so cut us a little bit of slack. Oopsie-daisy, was I supposed to say that? Whoopsie, was, did I say the quiet part out loud? Because what has COVID represented? Yes, it has represented this mass hysteria over all segments of society 
for a virus that has a very, very low infection mor mortality rate, or infection fatality rate, rather. Yes, it represents a reordering of political rights. Yes, it's a massive power grab from the bureaucracy, taking away lots of liberties that we once had. But let's not forget the economic aspect. This COVID lockdown phenomenon has been the largest transfer of wealth from the lower and middle classes to a select few very wealthy, powerful people in our nation's history. Maybe well beyond our nation's history. Just consider Amazon. Just consider your own behavior with Amazon. We now, and for the past year and a half, have accelerated the trend of ordering every freaking thing in the world from Amazon. So much so that there's a book paper shortage going on right now because people are using so much more cardboard because now instead of going down the street to the store to order, I don't know, to go buy a box of Q-tips or something, even that you're going to order from Amazon. Right? A major transfer of wealth from small businesses to these much larger conglomerates that can deal with the world being shut down for a year and a half. And those corporations have a radical social agenda. I just saw this the other day. It just came to my attention on Amazon. Do you know that on Amazon, you can shop by the identity, the political identities of the business owners? What I mean by that is if you go on Amazon right now, you can type in black owned business. Just type it right into the search bar and a big banner will come up and it will say shop at businesses owned by black people. Now, what does this mean? I don't know. Does this mean that black people need to own a 50%, 51% maybe, or 50% plus one vote stake in the business? What about, what if it's 49% owned by white people, but 51% owned by black people? Is it still a black owned business? I don't know. Maybe you can go to the, the Amazon shop by category page and see they've got links for black owned businesses. They've got links for women owned businesses. So I was looking through, I said, okay, this it's very, very woke. Uh, what happens if I want to shop at uh, straight white guy owned businesses? I don't, look, I don't have any particular impulse to shop at straight white guy owned businesses. But what if I did? This is the new rule. You're allowed to, to pick where you're going to shop based on the identity of the owner. Okay, do to do. So I type it in and you'll be shocked to find out it doesn't come up. And then you look on the page, the shop by category page, it's nowhere to be found because that would be racist. If you go to a sh white owned business page, that's racist. If you go to a black owned business page, very not racist, anti-racist actually. If you go to a man-owned business page, sexist, woman-owned business page, not sexist. Of course, that is incoherent. Either they both are racist or neither is racist. Either they both are sexist or neither is sexist. And what it leads to is something that we've seen increasingly, which is a, an official policy of that much maligned straight white guy as the worst type of person who has ever existed, of of white people in particular, but with some other groups as well, officially as second-class citizens and with men officially as second-class citizens. The clearest place, of course, to see this is at university admissions, which is that if you are a white guy or an Asian guy for some reason, you will be disadvantaged. You will be put in, in a, a lower category if you're applying to university than if you're a black person or an Hispanic person. If you're a man, you will be put in a lower, especially if you're a straight guy, you'll be put in a lower category. You will be disadvantaged than if you are a woman, or you can claim some other kind of victim status. But that, that is a social hierarchy. There you are saying certain people are going to get certain things. And this, this process that we are in right now, this radical social transformation, is accelerating that. We're all guilty of it, but when you shop at places like Amazon, you are accelerating that trend. Now, what is the answer? Is the answer just never to shop at Amazon? I don't even think that's really feasible. Amazon just has too much power. So I don't think we need to say, let's go knock down Amazon or never shop there again. But what we need to do is wield political power to stop this stuff. Because I don't want to live in a world <laughs> where we are defined by these radical social, sexual, and racial hierarchies. And we are in. I mean, the one, the one thing Jen Psaki is getting right here is this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. The economy is being reordered. Just, just in August, we have got from CNBC a report of a record 
million workers quitting their jobs. And what we are told, by the way, is that when 4.3 million workers quit their jobs, even with a labor shortage, right? There's a what, 11 million person labor shortage going on right now. When all these workers quit their jobs, it's a sign of economic strength. That's actually how the left is trying to spin this because they say, look, people are quitting their jobs because they're, they're not worried about getting another job. Well, sure, we're in a labor shortage right now, but why, why are they really quitting their jobs? Might it have anything to do with the powers that be, the ruling class, telling people not to work and then telling people that if they don't get an experimental drug for a virus that for most people doesn't pose a grave threat to them, they're going to be fine. They're going to lose their jobs. And then telling employers to fine, that they're going to have to pay fines if the workers don't comply. And then also the government paying people not to work for months and months, well over a year now on end. Might it have anything to do with that? And why, why is the government doing that? Is it sheer incompetence? I don't think so. Is it out of the goodness of their heart? I don't think so. Do you remember a few years ago when, when Marco Rubio glitched out during that debate and he said, we must dispel with this fiction that Barack Obama doesn't know what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing. And Chris Christie called him out and it was kind of the end of Marco's, Marco's presidential campaign. Well, he was right. He had a point. We need to dispel with the fiction that the left is incompetent, that poor Biden is just incompetent. He doesn't know what he's doing. These people know exactly what they're doing. They're using a crisis to their advantage and we on the right are letting them do it. Southwest Airlines has been at the epicenter of this economic turmoil over the past few days. And it's because on Sunday, we covered it on Monday, on Sunday, a thousand flights get canceled for Southwest. And the day before that, it was a whole lot of flights were canceled. And the day, a day after that, a whole lot of flights were canceled. And Southwest Airlines officially said it was because of weather. But I don't know about you. Sunday was perfectly beautiful where I was. I don't think there were any major storm systems that moved in. Some other airlines didn't have a problem. And over the ensuing days, what came out was that there was a sick in, that there were pilots and notably air traffic controllers in places that were in particular affecting Southwest that called in sick because they didn't want to comply with the vaccine mandate. And so what are you going to do? You've got a vaccine mandate at the level of the federal government, right? So that could affect the air traffic controllers. That's a direct mandate saying, get the, get the vaccine or lose your job. But then you've got the, the cowardly, Byzantine, complicated vaccine mandate that, that Barack, Barack Obama, that, that Joe Biden instituted on the employees of companies with more than 100 employees. And that was by ordering the Occupational Safety and Health Administration to order the companies with these, this number of employees to order the employees to take the vaccine or the companies would have to pay $14,000 fines. Now the fine has actually been increased a whole lot more. And so over the ensuing days, Southwest sort of came clean and the CEO went on TV and said, look, I hate the mandate. The only reason I'm pushing the mandate on my employees is because Joe Biden is making me and we can't afford to pay these gazillion dollar fines every single time we are caught violating the mandates. And that's half true, okay? But it's not totally true. It's yes, Joe Biden started this. He instituted this, or he, he made this ridiculous proclamation that all of these companies are gonna have to go along with the vaccine mandate. But they're not actually enforcing that right now. OSHA, that agency that was tasked with doing it, hasn't even really issued the formal rules. Basically, it was just a big press event. It's like a big press release. And I think what it did in effect was give woke CEOs the, some cover to demand that their employees take the vaccine while being able to blame it on Joe Biden. Now, I, I don't think that the CEO of Southwest is necessarily a big woke guy. They've actually done some pretty conservative things in the past. So I'm not, not really accusing him of that. But I think it is a wake-up call for, for other companies here. You don't need to go along with this. Look at us, okay? I don't want to toot our own horn here at the Daily Wire. But when that, when that uh, mandate came out, what did, what did the Daily Wire say? Jeremy Boring, the God King here at the Daily Wire, went on the air and he had three words for Joe Biden. And those words were not, let's go Brandon. Actually, those words were, let's go Brandon. They were the true meaning of let's go Brandon. We said, no, thank you, buddy. We're not going to comply with this. Sue us, take us to court. We hired a bunch of lawyers. And look, if we were, a, we're the fastest growing conservative media company in the country, but we have 
<laughs> relatively limited resources compared with an entity like Southwest Airlines or any of these other large entities. So if we can lawyer up and we can stand firm, why can't you? I actually think that these other companies can, and I don't want them just passing the buck on to Joe Biden. The CEOs need to stand up. If you're not going to do it now, when are you going to do it? This is a generational opportunity that, that the left sees, and they're going to try to take full advantage of it, and they're even bragging about it now from the White House. And so they've got to stand up, and they've got to, they've got to have the courage to defend the rights of their employees. And, uh, and don't blame Joe Biden if you're not going to do it. Yeah, we, uh, Joe Biden is a, not a great guy, and he's doing a lot of terrible things. But what are you doing, business owners? What are you doing, CEOs? It was, it was encouraging to see the Southwest CEO go on TV and say it's all Biden's fault in a certain sense because it shows that even in our corrupt culture, these powerful people can still turn on Joe Biden <laughs> because they're feeling the heat from their own guys. But we need to see a lot more of that. Otherwise, the left is going to succeed at radically changing our world as a result of COVID. CNN right now is, is referring to the time before the COVID lockdowns as, I kid you not, the before times, capital B, capital T. I don't know how many of you are history buffs, but in our civilization, traditionally, the way that we refer to the dating, you know, to, to the years in our calendar is with a BC, referring to the time before Christ, and AD, the Anno Domini, the year, the year of our Lord, right? That's the traditional way. And then the libs came in and the atheists, and they said, no, how dare you? We can't refer to Christ, this, the central figure in our civilization and in uh, the entire cosmos. We can't refer, that would be very wrong. So we're going to refer to the common era. So then they, they, and they thought this was very clever because they could change BC to BCE. This is before the common era and then after the common era. But no, we've gotten even crazier than that stupid dating. We're now into the B, BT and AT, I don't know, the before times and the after times. What CNN tweeted was, quote, if you hoped grocery stores this fall and winter would look like they did in the before times with limitless options stretching out before you in the snack, drink, candy, and frozen foods aisles, get ready for some disappointing news. It's not going to happen. And it's, they're blaming it on supply chain. And it's, and it's all because of, because of COVID. It's not because of COVID. The, the time before the lockdowns does not need to be the absolutely unrelatable before times, and the time we're living in now doesn't need to be radically different because of COVID. COVID, relative to other scourges that humanity has faced, is just not that big a freaking deal. I'm not saying it, it doesn't exist. I'm not saying it doesn't pose a threat, especially to some people. But relative to other problems that our world has faced, I don't know, bubonic plague, or I don't know, smallpox even, or I don't, wars, it's just not that big a freaking deal relative to those other issues. Certainly not so much so that we need to say that this is the defining event in our civilization's history. But it can be that big a deal. It can be that big a deal if we allow it to. I think that if the left has its druthers, then 2019 and all the years before that will just seem so different. Oh my gosh, back in those days, we used to drive a lot of places. We used to go into work. We used to see each other. Can you imagine going and seeing each other's faces and smiling? Breathing the same filthy air that the peasants would breathe? Oh, those were crazy before times when you would see people and not just have everyone walk around muzzled all the time. When you would go into an office building, go into a school building, and actually interact with one, oh, it was crazy before. Thankfully now, though, we all live in our pods and eat the bugs and just give all of our money to a handful of oligarchs who, who control speech, who control our elections, who control, oh, that's so much better. We, do you know we used to go vote on election day in our republic? Oh my goodness, in the crazy before times. Now we just uh, fill in mail-in votes with, with no verification and we trust the ruling class to conduct fair elections. When even Barack Obama admitted to us a few years before we went into the post before times that that would uh, pose a grave threat to election integrity. Oh yes, but we live in a much better time right now. We're seeing this happen all around us. It is this grab of, of power these people using, using this moment as an opportunity 
to reorder society. There's a story, I'm going to get to it a little bit more tomorrow. We don't have a ton of time to get into it today, but Stephen Crowder just texted me, so I feel that I ought to mention it. They're censoring Crowder again. And they always censor Crowder, and you might say, well, it's because Crowder, you know, look, he's an edgy comedian. And he'll, yeah, yeah, he's a comedian. That's the definition of a comedian. They, they push boundaries. They get a little subversive sometimes. But the reason they went after Crowder this time is because he was pushing a hateful, violent idea. Do you know what the idea was? The idea was that transgender bathroom policies might not be all that great for some people. And do you know why he pushed that idea? Because of a story that the Daily Wire broke. Because... We said a year ago that we were going to hire investigative journalists. We were not just going to reinterpret stories from the left-wing investigative outlets and take away the bias and actually present the facts, but we were going to go investigate our own stories and cover stories that the left doesn't even want to publish. And we just broke a story that a girl, a teenage girl, was allegedly very, very viciously and violently raped in a bathroom by a man who would occasionally wear a skirt in a place where now boys were allowed to go in the girls' room because of the so-called compassionate transgender policies. And this was considered violent, not because of the violent act that happened to this teenage girl, violent because we suggested that maybe boys shouldn't, or that Crowder suggested rather, maybe boys shouldn't go into the girls' room. You're not going to see a lot from Crowder in the coming week because of that. These are the people who are controlling our society. We're going we're gonna to have to talk to Crowder uh, this week, next week. I mean, he's going to be off for a little while. We'll cover it a little bit more tomorrow. But in the meantime, we've got to take a very quick break. You know, we had a great time the other night at the Ryman Auditorium. Uh, It it was a a fabulous backstage at one of the most legendary concert halls in the United States. We also dropped some extremely exciting news. The Daily Wire has a ton of new projects in the works. Um, We had been keeping them a little bit under wraps, but now they are out. We're pleased to announce that we have officially dropped the teaser trailer for Shut In. This is Daily Wire's first original production. You know, we had released our first movie that had already been shot and we acquired it and distributed it. That was Run, Hide, Fight. Well, now we've got our first original production, Shut In. The film follows a young mother who's barricaded inside a pantry by her violent ex-boyfriend and must use her ingenuity to protect her two small children from escalating danger while finding an escape. Here is a quick 60-second look into a thriller that you are not going to want to miss. Laney! I told you I need to see you at all times. Do you understand me? Well, I'm going to take off tonight so the kids can sleep most of the way. Well, I'm mostly done. I just need to finish cleaning out the pantry. Lainey? Lainey? Mommy, someone's here. (laughs) Mommy! Very, very intense. We also want to share with you a message from the fearless Gina Carano, whom I love. Talk about standing up and thumbing your nose and not allowing yourself to be pushed around by very corrupt left-wing people. Uh, Gina is talking about her new Daily Wire movie, Terror on the Prairie, which just started production this week. Take a look. Hi, Daily Wire members. This is Gina Carano. I'm coming to you from the set of Terror on the Prairie. Um, We came up to Montana and it is absolutely God's country. We're making new friends. We've attracted the most incredible cast and crew and and a hell of a director. We're going to make a great, great movie. Um, I'm in love with the script. I'm in love with the character. I'm living fantasy right now. So um, I can't wait for you guys to see it. We're going to work hard. After we announced our first project this summer, the Hollywood Union started debating vaccine mandates for cast and crew, and I wasn't into that. I don't believe anybody gets to make your medical choices for you, and I'm not willing to force masks and vaccines on anyone else. Thank you to all the Daily Wire members. You guys have been an extended family. Uh, thank you to, to you know everybody for making this possible. Without you, I, 
I don't know where I'd be right now. And right now there's no other place I'd rather be. So I hope everybody is doing well. Um, keep fighting, stick together. We got this, never give up. This is all coming to Daily Wire in 2022. There is no better time to join us than now. Head on over to dailywire.com slash subscribe. Enter code 2022 for 25% off your membership. Uh, You'll get a new Daily Wire membership. That's dailywire.com slash subscribe. Enter code 2022. We'll be right back with a lot more. A school in England has banned the terms good and bad. (laughs) This sounds like an Onion headline or a Babylon Bee headline. It's not. They have banned the terms good and bad to describe student behavior because the headmaster wants to remove, quote, emotional words from classroom management. This is at Lowborough Amherst School. They are now told to describe student behavior, which is either good or bad as skillful or unskillful. Uh, The headmaster, Dr. Julian Murphy, says the policy, which he he took, I'm not joking, he took the policy from Buddhism, was, quote, designed to take the emotional heat out of our language. Uh, Dr. Murphy said he did not want teachers to go soft, but he doesn't want them to be shouty either. And he especially doesn't want pupils to feel guilty. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. I, we have a lot of this in our country, too. D- don't be so judgy. You know, come on. Don't, you can't say that something's good. Or what, if, what if what you think is good actually someone else thinks is bad? Don't you impose your values on me, man. We need to use these less emotional terms, skillful or unskillful. Now, there's one big problem with this, which is namely that bad students can be very skillful at being bad. You know, dirty, rotten students can be really skillful at being rotten. Right? You remember this. The the kid who was a jerk in class, who was always telling jokes, he was very skillful at telling jokes and distracting the class. Kids who, I don't know, they commit crimes, they steal things, they pick fights, they perform violent acts in school bathrooms, as we just saw in Loudoun County, the story that we just broke. They can be very skillful at that. It actually does require skill to steal and to commit acts of violence and to do all sorts of bad things. But it's still bad. It's still rotten. What what the left is trying to do here, what this school is trying to do here in England, is they're trying to apply scientific materialism. They're trying to apply the, the modern notions of utilitarianism, of, of efficiency, of, really of science, to moral questions. Okay, so those skillful or unskillful, because we don't want people to sound, to, to feel guilty. This is what, what the headmaster says. I think it's human psychology, even when you're an adult. If you make people feel guilty, then you get angry. And then actually, that's when you're likely to play the blame game and not to work that well. That's when things get into a bit of a vicious circle. So the reason that we have problems and the reason that people do bad things, according to this headmaster, is because people feel guilty. That's one view of it. Uh, That's not my view of it, though. I think the reason that people do bad things is, one, because they, they don't feel guilty. They don't have the sense of sin. Or two, because they are not made to be held to account for their feelings of guilt and shame. It is very important to have a sense of shame and and guilt and sin. I know (laughs) in our culture, we're told, don't shame, don't slut shame, don't body shame, don't shame shame, don't, don't ever have shame, only have pride, don't ever have shame. Shame is a good thing. Shame is a very helpful tool. It lets you know when you're going down the wrong path. Okay, we need a lot more of it. We live in a shameless society. We ought to have a society where people feel a greater sense of shame. The whole point of education is to teach people not to follow their basest appetites and passions and do whatever they want. It's, to, it's actually, the whole, the whole point of education is to help cultivate a sense of shame in people. Because education is not just learning a few facts from a history book. Education is about the whole person. It's bringing up the whole person and making them capable of their freedom. This is why we refer to the liberal arts. And a whole lot of that is cultivating a sense of shame and saying, don't do that. Bad boy, Johnny. No, no, no more of that. 
be a good little boy, and learn to govern yourself, and then you can be a free person. But the left broadly does not want to cultivate free citizens because free citizens are really hard to control. They want to encourage you to run away with your sexual appetites or your uh, whatever, your, your food appetites, your drink appetites, your entertainment appetites. They want these things to run away and master you so that they, who are pulling a lot of these levers, will find it easier to control you and to control the political order. That's not a, a conspiracy theory. <laughs> Getting back to the comment at the top of the show. They've been telling us this since the 1960s. I write about this in my book, Speechless. The radical theorists on the left who developed our current political orthodoxies, they write about this a lot. It's the way they've attained cultural hegemony, and we ought to take it back. We've gotten so stupid, speaking of education. The, the San Antonio Spurs coach, Greg Popovich, he just said one of the dumbest things I think that I've ever heard. I can't believe how much sports I have to watch these days. I'm not the biggest sports guy. I don't think I'm shocking anybody when I say that. I, I, the only sport I like is baseball, and when they went woke last year, I canceled my subscription. I, but now I've got I've to watch football because of Gruden. I've got to watch basketball because of this guy Popovich. Greg Popovich seems to believe that if you honor Christopher Columbus, who some of us honored this week, that, that's, that's no different than a German celebrating Hitler. Indigenous Peoples Day slash Columbus Day. Columbus? I mean, he, he initiated a new world genocide. That's what he did. He took slaves. Uh, he, he mutilated. He murdered. Uh, and we're going to they're going to say slash and honor him. It's Columbus Day. That's why they're off on Monday. You know, maybe there's something I'm missing and I'm ignorant. But it makes me feel like they're living in a phone booth and they're educating our kids. Columbus Day. And we're going to honor that. And it's, it's, it's no knock on Italian Americans. That's a silly argument. You know, it's, it's like saying we should be proud of Hitler because we're German. I mean, it makes no sense. It's about Columbus. It's not about Italian Americans. So there's one thing that this guy said that was true, which is maybe I'm ignorant and maybe I don't know anything. Yeah, I don't. I think he is probably ignorant and I think he probably spent most of his school years dribbling and that's perfectly fine. That's, that's his job and his career. But he clearly didn't pay a lot of attention in history class. I'm not going to rehash the arguments over Columbus. Columbus was a great guy who did a lot of great things, notably bringing Christianity to the Western Hemisphere. He's accused of doing a lot of things that he never did. And by the way, for a lot of the indigenous peoples that were here, their culture wasn't all that great to begin with, notably the cannibalism and the human sacrifice. Some, some people were good people <laughs> to, to invoke the former president. Some, I suppose, were good people. But, uh, but Columbus was far less bad and far more good than people give him credit for. And the indigenous peoples had some pretty horrifying demonic practices that, that Columbus and the Spaniards who came after him put an end to, rightly so. But notice the angle here. The angle is this celebrating Columbus, if you're an Italian, is like a German celebrating Hitler, which means that Columbus and Hitler are the same person. They're comparable. And the, because the, you got the Italian people, you got the German people, and they're both admiring these guys, and so these guys are comparable, right? That, that's the argument. But it's not true. It's ridiculous. It's this new angle to say that the, the person, Christopher Columbus, who is responsible for bringing our civilization to the new world, is evil. Right, the embodiment, in many ways, of Western civilization is evil, meaning the civilization itself is evil. And when we, when we talk about all these radical theorists who developed this stuff, I know sometimes people are skeptical and they say, Michael, how on earth does some radical Marxist in his ivory tower at Harvard University, you're telling me that that guy, because he wrote some ridiculous book that no one has ever really read, that is affecting our whole culture. Yes, it does have downstream effects in our culture, even to the point that this ignorant basketball coach is spouting the lies being pushed by radical academics and polemicists, including, in this case, someone like Howard Zinn, who, who is a revisionist historian. He's not even really an historian. He's a political activist. It does have effects all the way down the line. 
The left has taken its once-in-a-generation opportunities every time they pop up over every single generation, and they've used it to great political effect, and we have not, and that's to our disadvantage. Columbus is like Hitler. Give me a break. Now, speaking of famous painters, how's that for a segue? Hunter Biden is selling his artwork. Hunter Biden, you you know this. Hunter Biden uh, is has <laughs> given up his life of crime, apparently, and drugs and hookers and selling his father's influence and selling out the United States. Now he's making his money an honest way by selling his scribbles for half a million dollars. It's, it would seem that some of the art collectors are not so interested in the doodles of this degenerate Hunter Biden, but they perhaps are trying to buy some influence with the president of the United States. So Joe Biden was just asked about this by a reporter, and he brushes it off. He laughs as he's walking by. He says, you got to be kidding me. President Biden, are you concerned about potential corruption with your son's art are you concerned about potential corruption? How's your, aller- How's your allergies, Mr. President? Are you concerned? And it's, hard, it's a little bit hard to hear in this clip because Biden basically doesn't break his stride. He says, you, you got to be kidding me. You got to be kidding me. And this is, this is almost more offensive than Hunter Biden actually peddling the influence as he did not just now, but for many, many years. It's, it's how casual the corruption is. You got to be kidding me. Come on. The big guy's going to take a little cut off the top. Come on. What do you expect? Of course, of course my son's going to sell my name and sell out the country for half a million dollars per scribble. Come on. And you're going to ask me about it? I'm not even going to dignify that with a response. And the corporate media won't dignify that with a response. And no one's held to account for it. It's so brazen. It's so casual. It, it represents how dispirited we are in this, the or ordinary American people who feel discouraged and dispirited like we can't even speak out against this kind of thing. Just... Detouring back to Columbus for a quick second, Elizabeth Warren on Monday. Elizabeth Warren, Liawatha herself, had the gall to wish people a happy Indigenous Peoples Day, as if she had not built her career lying about being a Native American. She goes, quote, I'm glad to stand with tribal nations and Native communities as we celebrate their remarkable contributions, cultures, and resilience on Indigenous Peoples Day. It's time the federal government also honors its promises to Native peoples. So first of all, there's a tacit acknowledgement in the first sentence that she is not Native American, as she claimed for decades, right? She says, I'm glad to stand with tribal nations and Native communities. Well, who are you? St- I thought you were one of them. I thought you were the person to be stood with. I didn't know that you were the person doing the stand. So she tacitly admits that. But, but she, it's so casual. She says it as if she had not gotten her whole career pretending to be a Native American, very possibly taking jobs from actual Native American people who are given preferential treatment in our hiring process and in our school admission process because there is an officially, legally imposed racial hierarchy that says that some people are good, uh, notably uh, black people and to some degree Hispanic people and Native American people, and some people are bad, white people and Asian people. What the Asians did, I don't know. I don't even know. Because the Asians are white supremacists because the Asians have white privilege or something like that. And it's just so casual. No shame from Elizabeth Warren. No apology whatsoever. She just keeps on keeping on. And we are not really allowed to say boo about it. You know, we, I saw this firsthand last night at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. So if you're watching this show right now, instead of just listening to it, you'll notice that I'm not in my usual studio. The reason for this is I'm on the road with Senator Ted Cruz. We're here taking our verdict show live on the road. We were scheduled to go to University of Wisconsin-Madison last night. Then we're going to Texas A&M tonight. You can still get your tickets, by the way. Head on over to yaf.org. You can uh, still reserve tickets, get all the information you, you want there. And then we're going to go to Catholic University in D.C. next week. So the tour began with this really big hiccup. Namely, the University of Wisconsin-Madison didn't want us to come. And so in the past, when, when the lib schools have wanted to kick out conservatives, they have you know, made up bogus reasons, security reasons. They would, they would kind of go in and stop the students from reserving lecture halls, and they, they'd be at least a little bit subtle about it. Now, they just literally want to muzzle us. So the <laughs> University of Wisconsin-Madison, the administrators of that school, the provost of that school, came out and they said, not only do all the students need to be masked in the audience, which is ridiculous, and we were pushing back on that to begin with, 
They said, actually, you, Michael, and you, Ted Cruz, need to be masked while you're speaking. You need to muzzle yourselves during the event while you're on stage. So we would have said, you know, and no one would have understood a word of it. They wouldn't relent. There's an exemption to the policy. If you're putting on an education-related arts performance, that was one exemption in particular. They've given this exemption to liberals who have come to the campus in, in recent weeks and months. But they won't give the exemption to me or to Ted Cruz. Shows you where power really lies in this country. Because I'm not saying that I'm, I am necessarily the most powerful politician in this country, right? Who am I? I'm just a guy with a show. Ted Cruz is a United States senator going to give an educational lecture with an educational organization at a publicly funded, taxpayer funded university in Wisconsin. And some punk administrator says, no, we don't. Ted Cruz, as mainstream a guy as you can possibly get, was very nearly the Republican nominee for president in 2016. No, no, he's, he's radical. We don't like him. No, sorry. Sorry, guys, you don't get to speak here. So we threw some really great stuff that Yaff and our team over at Verdict and Senator Cruz's team were able to pull off. We did get an alternative venue. The school still didn't want to release the guest list to us. They didn't want us even to be able to be in contact with the people who were going to go. Proves to you it had nothing to do with campus health. It had everything to do with shutting us up. But we were able still to bring hundreds and hundreds of people to our event last night. We had a good time. But it, it shows you how dispiriting these things can be because the left has the power and they're not afraid of anyone. This punk provost is not even afraid of a sitting United States senator willing to try to shut them up as well. E even on the left, obviously we, we notice this, this happens when the left tries to shut us up on the right and YouTube is doing it right now to Steven Crowder and to a lesser degree to me, uh, you know, and, the, and they're, the universities are doing it to conservatives, but the left does it to other leftists when the left wing people contradict the narrative. Katie Couric just got caught for this. Katie Couric, the very left-wing former anchor of the Today Show, has uh, just revealed, reportedly, in her memoir, Going There, that she edited out a comment that Ruth Bader Ginsburg made, the notorious RBG, had made regarding the, the athlete kneeling protests. So when this all started with Colin Kaepernick and disrespecting the American flag and not standing for the Star Spangled Banner, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the late left-wing justice, was asked by Katie Couric what she thought about it. And she said, the people who kneel for the anthem are showing, quote, contempt for a government that has made it possible for their parents and grandparents to live a decent life. And Katie Couric edited out those comments. This is not the first time that Katie Couric has edited out comments that were inconvenient to her leftist narrative. She did this in a documentary that she made about guns. She, she deceptively edited it to make it seem as though she was asking a question and had stumped the pro-gun people. She had, like just took, took totally different clips, completely out of context, and spliced them up so it looked like she had asked the person a simple question about guns and gun rights. And then the, the gun person said, you know, duh, I don't know, and was like scratching their head. But it was just completely separate footage. So she's not above doing this sort of thing. But she took it out. And why did Katie Couric take out Ruth Ginsburg's obviously correct answer about the national anthem? Well, Katie Couric says it's because uh, the, the justice was elderly, quote unquote and probably didn't fully understand the question. So Katie Kirk, just to be kind to RBG, took that out. No, she, I think Ruth Ginsburg actually did understand the question. So Ruth Ginsburg is, on the one hand, the most brilliant, wonderful, serious, tough jurist, single-handedly saving the republic, so strong. Do you remember they made that ridiculous, several ridiculous documentaries about her, showing her doing push-ups, you know, and they would have some really fit physical trainer. And he would say, oh, wow, I can barely keep up with her. Oh, she's so fit and, and nimble and she's so smart. But then the minute she goes off the reservation, oh, no, she's frail. No, she's elderly. It would be, it would be elder abuse, basically, to, to act, put her clear and articulate and correct answer in this. So we're going to get rid of it. She probably just didn't get it, right? right? So it, it just shows you that not even the left's icons have the power to contradict the ruling class. All that crap about the notorious RBG and, oh, yeah, you go girl, and wow, yes, slay queen, it's all fake. They use her. 
they use her as a pawn. They don't use her anymore. She's no, I mean, I guess now they'll use her memory. But they just, all of these people, whether they're celebrities, they're in sports, they're in Hollywood, they're in the government, they, they use them to advance their agenda. But the agenda is a generational one. And so, yes, they'll exploit people and they'll exploit events and they'll exploit the coronavirus to totally remake society. But they've got that clear goal in mind and they are not going to change course just because one of their own says so or just because the economy goes in a certain direction or just because the Constitution says so. The only way they're going to change course is if we win political power and we stop them. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. See you tomorrow. The Michael Knowles Show is produced by Ben Davies. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Supervising producer, Mathis Glover. Production manager, Pavel Vidovsky. Editor and associate producer, Danny D'Amico. Associate producer, Justine Turley. Audio mixer, Mike Coromina. And hair and makeup by Cherokee Hart. The Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2021. Today on The Ben Shapiro Show, the shipping bottleneck continues as Joe Biden ignores reality and blames private companies. Inflation continues to spike while the White House downplays the problem. And Hunter Biden's email scandal starts to infect Joe. That's today on The Ben Shapiro Show. Mm-hmm.